man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. When Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote those words, he was talking about the relationship between governments and individuals and which direction that relationship was going to take. He was concerned with the future of monarchy, democracy, and the very foundations of Western civilization and the Enlightenment. Not whether motorcycle riders' brains were going to be spilled all over the road in an accident. But alas, the purpose of this video is a little bit less grandiose, so we'll talk about spilling brains and leave the Enlightenment for another day. Let's look at helmet laws, the purposes they serve, the freedoms they restrict, and whether or not they are a just or an unjust infringement of our right to feel the wind through our hair. Stay tuned. I first started thinking about helmet laws a year before I got my first motorcycle. It was 1998 and Brooke and I decided to pack up our ancient Camry station wagon and take a six week camping trip down the coast of Canada and the US. At the time, I was already interested in buying a motorcycle. I was young, poor and naive, and the call of the open road was strong. Our second stop on the trip was New Hampshire, and I was busy checking out the passing Harleys which seemed to be everywhere, when I noticed something was different. A lot of the riders were lidless. Their heads conspicuously unadorned by safety equipment, they rumbled about with their hair or bald heads or bandanas in the breeze. The reason for this? Even in a country that has traditionally been the champion of individualism, New Hampshire stands out as being particularly independent. It is one of the swing states in any election, as its voters are not wedded to either major political party. New Hampshire asserts its independence with a state motto, live free or die, a sentiment that is unapologetically blunt, yet strangely appealing, especially to a kid who grew up in communist Poland and lived through martial law. Some people may be taken aback by such a bold declaration, but I like it. And I suspect many other motorcyclists do as well. After all, as cliche as it sounds, motorcycling really is about freedom. Sitting on top of a two-wheeled machine which is hurtling down the road, being held up by gyroscopic forces exposed to the elements, the sights, the smells of the surroundings, the temperature and weather extremes, we like being free, don't we? Otherwise, why would we even ride? Let's take a look at the reasons why we should have helmet laws, as well as the reasons why we shouldn't. First, I'll go over the pro-helmet law side, and then cover the anti-helmet law arguments. So if your fingers are getting itchy, hang on until the end when you've heard both sides. Oh, and uh, subscribe and all that jazz. Let's start with the research. The most recent and comprehensive study that I was able to find on the subject was commissioned by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, an American agency concerned with keeping folks safe on US roads. This study, which was published in 2017, determined that helmets are indeed effective in saving motorcyclists' lives. Here are some specifics. Helmets have been found to be 37% effective in preventing fatalities of motorcycle riders and 41% effective in saving the lives of passengers. In other words, for every 100 helmetless riders who died in motorcycle accidents, 37 could likely have been saved, and that number is 41 for passengers. I know that people will argue about these numbers in the comments and have all kinds of questions about the methodology used in the study, so I'll leave a link in the description so that you can read it for yourself. In addition to saving lives, this study determined that had all motorcyclists who were involved in accidents been wearing helmets, $1.5 billion in economic costs and $8.9 billion in comprehensive costs could have been saved. Economic costs include things like lost productivity, medical, insurance, legal, EMS and court costs, property damage and workplace losses. Comprehensive costs add lost quality of life to the economic costs, because laying in bed drooling all day tends to degrade your quality of life. In addition to research-based arguments, you also have the common sense ones. If helmets really do make you safer, why not wear one? It seems to be the wise thing to do. Anyone who cares about their personal safety should wear one. Anyone who cares about their loved ones and wants to be able to see them after a motorcycle accident should wear one. Anyone who has people depending on them and doesn't want those people to be left on their own should wear one. Those are the arguments for helmet laws, and compelling arguments they are. But what about the arguments against them? There are several, but ultimately they boil down to one word. Freedom. Freedom is one of those buzzwords that is misused and overused by many people. Sometimes I'll throw it into a video ironically, accompanied by some cheesy sound effect to indicate that I'm being facetious, but that does not mean I don't value it. Growing up in a communist country where freedom of speech and movement were not protected, I saw firsthand how the lack of individual freedom could affect a person's life. 
Here in Canada, I'm able to criticize the government without fear of being jailed or killed. I have the opportunity to use my talents to make my own way in life, and I can make decisions about my own welfare, safety, and the chances I am willing to take. One of those decisions is riding a motorcycle, and another one should be whether or not I want to wear a helmet. These are decisions that every adult human being of sound mind should be given the credit to make for themselves, without the need for a nanny government to wag its finger in their face because it thinks it knows better. You see, in the face of this argument, all the arguments for helmet laws are dubious. Helmets save more than a third of the riders who wear them and are involved in accidents? Cute. The same study that discovered those numbers also found that motorcyclists are 27 times more likely to die than the occupants of cars per mile of road traveled. Surprised? Don't be. We motorcyclists are not encased in a steel cage with the stability of four wheels and the added safety of crumple zones and airbags protecting us. We're also smaller and less visible than cars. So the government deems it okay for us to be involved in an activity that increases our chances of death by 2,700% but it mandates that we wear a hat that decreases our risk by 37%? Not too many mathematicians in the halls of government, I'm guessing. As for the costs of motorcycle accidents because of riders not wearing helmets, $1.5 billion consists of real costs, while $8.9 billion is the loss of quality of life, a cost that the rider choosing not to wear a helmet assumes for themselves. The real cost is $1.5 billion, which seems like a lot of money, but is nothing compared to the cost of drinking alcohol, smoking, or eating sugar. For context, the average American eats 57 pounds of sugar per year, and the healthcare cost of all this indulgence is reported by Forbes magazine to be, you might want to sit down for this one, one trillion dollars. I'm using the United States as an example because those numbers are more available. One third of US expenditures on healthcare are spent on fighting the effects of sugar in the average American diet. But people not wearing helmets incurs an unacceptable cost to the system? Are we living in bizarre world here? And no one is suggesting banning sugar, alcohol, or cigarettes. There'd be a revolution if any government did that, or at least a very quick and decisive election. We give folks enough credit to be able to make the choices to consume those products for themselves. In Canada, I can choose to legally take my own life but can't ride my motorcycle without a helmet. I might be an old-fashioned classical liberal, but my personal feeling is that my freedoms should not be curtailed unless they endanger or harm others. Jeremy Bentham wrote, every law is an infraction of liberty. So if you're going to infringe on my liberty, you'd better be doing it to protect someone else's. Because the truth is that the absence of helmet laws does not ban helmets. It simply provides adults with a choice of whether or not to wear them. It also does not endanger anybody besides the rider choosing not to wear one. I can see why jurisdictions may want to legislate the presence of devices like ABS. That may save your life, but may also prevent you from killing someone else if it allows you to stop quicker. But wearing a helmet affects no one else but you. The result of any accident you're involved in will be the same for any other vehicle or pedestrian involved, whether you're wearing a helmet or not. It's only your life that's in more danger when you don't have a lid on your head. We take our lives in our hands every time we fire up our iron steeds, but they are our lives, and our hands are the most appropriate place for those lives to be in. Ultimate safety is not our main concern. If it was, we wouldn't be riding motorcycles. Other factors play a role in our choices as well, and cheesy as it sounds, freedom is one of those factors. The freedom to hit the bar and drink your troubles away, to have a Coca-Cola on a hot summer day, to put on your favorite Doors album and roll up some pink kush. Here in Canada, that's perfectly legal by the way. And yes, to hit the open road, your hair flying in the breeze, which puts you at a slightly greater risk than having your hair encased in a shell. So by now you're probably thinking, this guy whips his helmet off every time he hits a state that allows it. Nope, I wear a helmet every time I ride a motorcycle, or bicycle for that matter, no matter where I am, and I always will. In fact, I try to wear all the gear all the time period, even on the hottest days. Why? Life experience, specifically relating to cycling, but cycling experience transfers. Two wheels are two wheels and a helmet is a helmet. I once saw a helmetless cyclist killed in front of me when he got t-boned by a truck. He died of a massive head injury while Brooke and I were standing over him on the phone with 911. It was a while before I was comfortable riding my bicycle on the road again after witnessing that. And I've personally broken a couple of helmets in cycling accidents that I walked away from because I was wearing helmets. But the most compelling evidence of the value of helmets is my wife Brooke. In 2015 we entered a 110km mountain bike race in Wilmington, New York State. The race was brutal. 
110k is about 67 miles, which is a very long ride on a mountain bike. The last few miles headed up Whiteface Mountain before descending to a ski resort where the finish line was located. I finished the race, changed and was waiting for Brooke to come into view, phone in hand ready to snap some pictures of her crossing the finish line. When she appeared up on the mountain I reached for the phone and looked up again to see that she had gone down on some loose rock on the course, and she wasn't getting up very fast. After covering 110 kilometers, she crashed within sight of the finish line. I tore up the hill along with several volunteers to find that Brooke was seriously disoriented. The back of her helmet was smashed and had a big crack where it hit the rocks. We walked down the hill and into medical where Brooke was starting to scare me. She couldn't remember anything that happened and was asking the same question over and over again. A trip to the hospital, an assessment, a diagnosis of a concussion, a drive back to Toronto, weeks of rest and months of headaches followed. Being who she is, Brooke went back to work way too early and probably set her recovery back by months. And for the next year she dealt with vertigo and dizziness following any sudden head movements. The body is an amazing machine with an incredible ability to heal itself and eventually the symptoms went away and life returned to normal. Brooke has fully recovered but has not mountain biked on gnarly terrain since. Now imagine if she hadn't been wearing that bicycle helmet. She wasn't riding very fast when she fell and impact standards on bicycle helmets are a lot less than those on motorcycle helmets. But without that helmet it would have been her skull, not the helmet that would have hit that rock. She may have suffered permanent damage or even been killed. Now I enjoy the freedom to make my own choices, among them to ride a motorcycle. And I like to believe that I have somewhat of a wild spirit with all the risky things I've done in my life. I want to retain the autonomy to make my own choices and continue to make decisions that concern my safety. And with regard to helmets, my decision will always be to wear one when I'm on two wheels. The fact that I have my wife beside me and the fact that she's not drinking all her food through a straw is testament to their effectiveness. But I still want to have the choice. Without choice we are inching toward authoritarianism and I have no desire to be under the thumb of an authoritarian government again. So who needs helmets? Anyone who wants to save their own life, reduce the severity of their injuries in case of an accident, and who doesn't want to subject their family to the grief of losing them. Yes, not wearing a helmet is a dangerous choice. Not as dangerous as riding a motorcycle, but still dangerous. Should it be a choice everywhere? What do you think? Are helmets mandated where you live? If not, do you wear one? Should they be mandated? Share your thoughts in the comments below. This is a topic that requires a nuanced perspective, so I'm looking forward to hearing from viewers, especially from places that don't have helmet laws. Stay safe out there. If you're interested in any of the gear that Brooke and I wear or use, or the camera equipment we use to film this channel, the links are below. Everything listed there was bought with our own money and we are not sponsored by any company. However, the links below are affiliate links and the channel is paid a small amount for referring you to shop at no additional cost to you. We do not recommend any products that we are not satisfied with ourselves, but we do strongly urge you to do your research and select the correct size for items like helmets and clothing. As always, thanks for watching, your support is greatly appreciated. Please hit that subscribe button, give the video a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And whatever you ride, enjoy it. Wave at other bikers no matter what they're riding, we're all part of a brotherhood and sisterhood. Keep the rubber side down, shiny side up, and may the spokes be with you.